Uh, thank you, Rachel. I um, basically uh, have 10 minutes, or perhaps it's slightly less, to talk to you about uh, the subject uh, of measuring the middle class, which is quite a daunting task, given the fact that it took us almost about six months of work to uh, work on this paper, and then I'll leave Naranjan to speak for another 10 minutes on the results. Uh, okay, without wasting much time, why do we want to study the middle class, and why uh, in the Arab region in particular? Well, anybody who was in Tahrir uh, Square a couple of years ago, like myself, looking around us, especially in the first week, would be able to discern, obviously, that it was a middle class uh, revolution. Now, of course, uh, that doesn't say too much because uh, there are so many different perspectives, sociological, political, economic, on how to define the middle class. Our paper is really more on the economic side, so that's just to situate uh, the, uh, the intellectual uh, orientation of our, our paper. But anyways, uh, the uprisings have really uh, put forward this question of, of really urgently trying to address the role of the middle class in economic and political participation, particularly as the region is going through uh, so, so many changes. Uh, but even if that weren't the case, it's surprising that uh, the definitions that we have and analytical methodologies to measure the middle class are really very poor compared to, for example, poverty and other areas, even though the middle class play a very vital role, as we all know, in economic development. So uh, who are the middle class? Well. As I said, there are so many con con competing perspectives. Um, you can almost find a debate uh, illustrated in this you know, uh, picture right in front of you that um, it, can give, it, can, it can be quite misleading to focus on one perspective rather than uh, another. What we try to do is to, in a paper is, first of all, review the uh, spectrum of uh, definitions out there, the economic ones. Um, and of, of course, those who have, uh, of you who are familiar know that uh, a lot of them are absolute in the sense that they tend to look at individuals between a minimum and an upper threshold. Uh, usually these would be like $2 to $20 if you're um, in one region or 10 to 100 for the global, um, 6 to 10 uh, for others. So again, the, there isn't a consensus on either the minimum or the upper threshold for measuring the middle class. Now, the lower threshold would typically try to measure a poverty line. So again, there's the discussion on, on the middle class has to be closely tied to how you define uh, the poor, because that sets your basis for uh, the lower threshold, while the upper threshold also has to answer the question of who do you think are uh, the affluent. Um, forget about the rich, because they're usually outside the tail of this whole discussion, but uh, but those two questions are essential for the economic uh, uh, perspective. In relative measures, others have focused on uh, more on the inequality side uh, of, of, of the uh, definition to look at people, for example, between the second, third, and fourth quantiles or uh, whose incomes uh, lie between the seven, uh, uh, 75 uh, to 125% of the median income. Others have used a combination of both, uh, like, for example, Birdsell. Uh, she's used uh, a combination of both the absolute and, and, and relative measures. So uh, that's basically what we have. And as you can see, there's uh, quite a variety of um, perspectives out there, economic perspectives, which it's not surprising would uh, give you uh, very different results. Uh, now, typically, you would expect that poorer countries would have lower upper and lower um, thresholds, and middle-income countries would have a medium range and so forth. And all of this is measured in uh, purchasing power parity terms, which is another set of complications, and it poses all, all kinds of other complications. But as I said, uh, you try to make sense of, the, going back to our basic question, who are the middle class, and you use these methodologies, for the Arab region, and this is the kind of picture you get. It ranges between 1% and 77%. So clearly they're of little use to decision makers. I mean, we, we, we just can't use uh, the bulk of, of, of these. And, and if we have to pick one of them, then you have to have a good justification. Uh, if we use, for example, the uh, measure of 10 to 100 uh, 
to try to estimate the size of the Arab middle class or the global middle class, you're looking at around 1.9 billion people, of which the Arab region is about uh, 5%. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on the problems. The, there are so many methodological problems with relying on, on the fixed poverty lines, for, for example, or any fixed line for a lower threshold. Um, there are even more fundamental problems with uh, fixing the upper threshold of the middle class. But let's say that uh, it's essentially a problem of uh, arbitrary choice, and it's a problem related to um, the choice um, of how you define a, 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 you know, somebody who's not a middle class. When do you stop becoming part of the middle class and you become an affluent person? That is really at the heart of, of the issue here. And of course there are issues related to the purchasing power parities which we are all familiar with. Uh, others like Deaton and Sanjay Reddy and others have shown that the purchasing power parity rule uh, has, is, doesn't hold for, um, for many countries. In other words, the 125 doesn't really buy the same uh, value of, I mean, um, the amount of, of purchasing power in Sierra Leone is very different than Egypt or, or Turkey for that matter. So what we try to do in our alternative approach is to start with a different uh, conceptual framework and, and really go back and ask the question, when uh, do you cease to become a middle class and graduate to become an affluent person. Here we try to go back to the literature on economic sociology. Uh, people like Thorsten and Veblen, in my opinion, give you a nice, uh, simple definition. And going back to his, his theory of conspicuous consumption, I think that plays an important part in our definition of somebody who, or an individual who is not a middle class. When an individual basically stop, starts uh, consuming conspicuously, uh, that is a qualitative aspect of an individual's consumption pattern that does not inherently belong to our sociological or economic definition of the middle class. So that's basically the premise, the intellectual premise that we're, we're using here. But also, there's also a quantitative basis for it, which is basically uh, to go back to what uh, the poverty economists have been doing and to uh, just drop the whole uh, international uh, measures and go back to the uh, national uh, poverty uh, surveys and, and household surveys and, and try to fix uh, the thresholds using these uh, surveys. So this is essentially what we've, we've tried to do and uh, in, in following our conviction that middle class is both an economic and a sociological phenomenon, we basically started off by answering two uh, questions. When uh, one of them is, of course, the economic definition. As I said, uh, the, uh, the definition is basically that uh, an, an individual is uh, a middle class when his income or her income or the family income is above a appropriately defined poverty line but below a uh, level of expenditure uh, of non on non-essential goods, which is less than the value of the poverty line. That's an important distinction because you need to even, you know, if you say that uh, somebody's expenditure or is, is conspicuous, or how do you, know, how do you measure that? Where, what's the cutoff? Where's the threshold at which you can say that it is becoming too much? Here, we're using the anchor as the value of the poverty line itself. Uh, so if a family, as, as we've translated it in, in this figure, if a family's expenditure is above point Z uh, star here, which is the uh, value of the upper poverty line, which I'm assuming we're all familiar with. It's typically the poverty line used by the World Bank and the UN to uh, estimate a, a higher threshold for measuring the uh, poverty. Uh, so if your income is above that point, uh, but uh, your income on non-essentials is below the value of the lower poverty line. That is basically how we define uh, the middle class. Uh, so that's the economic definition. And then there's also a sociological definition. So we, we, what we've tried to do is to come up with two definitions and then see what the interaction uh, is between uh, the, the families that fall into both groups. And the sociological definition is closer to the heart of, uh, you know, um, the, the economic sociology uh, basically defines uh, the middle class as uh, 
people who are employed in formal sectors and who have a certain high degree of uh, skill in occupational uh, categories. So that's basically what I, I know it's rather difficult to go through uh, these issues in, in such a short period of time, but I hope that I've tried to uh, uh, give you the gist of, of the argument. I'm leaving my colleague Neranjan to go through the results and show you what happens when we apply this methodology. Um, and of course, I'll be willing to answer questions on any more specific questions on the methodology later on in, in the Q&A session. So. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Khalid, for uh, the first part of the presentation. I think uh, with that, I'll, I'll straight move to uh, three things that uh, we'll try to come up with, with uh, by applying this methodology. I would like to highlight that this research is for policy and uh, we are presenting you some of the findings uh, basically which we are using for a larger report. Uh, and and uh, I, I'm going to say three things on one on why, how this methodology is uh, impacting on the size of the middle class in the Arab region for which we have data on nine uh, countries. We are using household survey data to estimate the middle class size. Um, I'm going to tell what uh, is happening to them in terms of uh, uh, jobs, because we also looked at the profile of the middle class uh, using this methodology. And uh, uh, again, lastly, how they are uh, I mean, uh, doing uh, against other population classes. So touching upon the inequality aspect uh, that the first presentation highlighted a bit also. Okay, here are the nine countries, and uh, I'm uh, using here the latest surveys, uh, Sudan, Yemen, Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Tunisia, and Oman. You can see that for some countries, the surveys are as earlier as 2006, for example, for Yemen, 2007, for Iraq, 2007, for Syria. And you know, uh, these countries are facing uh, difficult times and they're in crisis in Syria and Yemen particularly. But that factor keeping aside and using the latest household expenditure surveys as available, you could see that uh, in the lower income countries, uh, the uh, middle class size varies between 30 to 43 percent. Uh, the classification belongs to the World Economic and Social Prospects uh, Surveys. Uh, and you see in the middle income and the upper middle income countries, which ranges from Egypt to Tunisia, you could see that middle class size is quite, uh, they, are the, they, they are the majority group in the population classes. Of course, Egypt is a little bit uh, aberration because uh, Egypt has gone through uh, retardation of the middle class during uh, 2005 and 2011. I'll come back to it later. Uh, so there is a pattern which emerges by applying this method that uh, uh, lower income countries, middle income countries, and in the higher income country for which we have one country in the sample, which is Oman, it shows the affluent class are a majority, which is kind of expected. And I would like to highlight that the slide which showed uh, Ravalian's method or uh, global middle class method, those measurement approaches, if you take, it uh, doesn't, uh, I mean, they, they don't tally with the results that we are finding. We have explained it why on the analytical factors in the report, but for the sake of uh, showing the results, I will uh, I'll move to the next slide and show the regional picture. Uh, if we compare two period of time, and we have only six household surveys, we could see that nearly 50% of the Arab world uh, are middle class comparing to 73% in, in, in the Ravalian's method or 1% uh, 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 in the global uh, middle class uh, measurement methodology method. Uh, let alone uh, the impact of crisis, uh, but if you look at uh, 2011, it's like 45%. So more or less they have remained stable uh, between 2000 and 2011. Uh, the slight decline is due to Egypt uh, as it has a higher population weight and in Egypt poverty has increased between 2005 and 11 actually from 16% to 21% and that resulted in uh, the regional aggregate uh, in which poverty is increasing from 18 point to 21.8% uh, and, uh, and uh, reduction uh, in middle class size from 47% to 45%. <laughs> 
moving on well this this shows middle class are more capable which is uh, which is uh, in uh, line with uh, other global literature also because of uh, rising i mean increasing education levels and uh, we try to calculate an index of uh, how uh, what, what is the situation of human poverty or deprivation to standard of living they also show more or less a standard uh, uh, my picture where middle class middle class they are increasing their capability by increasing the level of education and also improving their standard of living in terms of uh, different housing and other 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 indicators what is interesting is in in this slide in the arab world what is the major sectors that contribute to the economy it is the mining and utilities or it is uh, uh, services sector now you could see here clearly that uh, during 2000 and 2011, the workforce has uh, moved quite significantly from agriculture to services. The, the slide shows the change, percentage change in the middle class population shared by economic sectors. Uh, but, I mean, of course, industry, a couple of uh, places, but uh, industry is not a major contributor, uh, given the fact that manufacturing contributes only 12% of the GDP in the Arab world. But if one looks at it in detail, then within the services sector, the majority of the workforce are in the other services category. Other services, they, are, they are tend to be low value added, they are not in, uh, I mean, something like construction, uh, I mean, uh, uh, construction or uh, um, uh, in services uh, uh, such as uh, um, hotels and restaurants, but not in trade or uh, transport, which are high value added sectors. You will not find that, that much uh, increase in uh, uh, services. And in this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, figure, it shows that, uh, particularly for the youth, the new entrants into the labor market, uh, there is a huge concentration of jobs in the services sector. And look at those countries uh, where we have two points of time, Egypt, Syria, Tunisia, and Jordan. In Egypt, the share of other services increased from 19% to about 35%. In Syria, it also shows an increase, in, and so also in Tunisia and Jordan. So they Point, point to the fact that uh, there is some informal, informalization going on, in, 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 although uh, they are, the workforce is moving from agriculture to services, but they are not high value added sectors, and that adds to the uh, 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 sufferings and uh, problems. And, and, and uh, just touching on the professionals that uh, Khalid uh, mentioned, these people are. Uh, Mm, those uh, the sociological middle class and, and they are a minority in the Arab world uh, uh, highest in Oman uh, with 15% only 12% uh, in Egypt and uh, as low as 5.8% in Yemen they also show that uh, mm, uh, they, they are also mainly concentrated in the service sector and within the service sector majority of them are in the other services category which are again low value added uh, 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 kind of work. And moving on quickly, we looked at the share of professionals within each uh, population class, poor, uh, vulnerable, uh, the middle class, and the affluent. Of course, uh, it is expected that um, uh, the, in the affluent class, the professional have in, uh, professional share have increased. But the critical factor is within the poor, and the vulnerable class, the share of professionals also have increased over time. Why that has increased? Partly one should look at what is happening to the wages, because these are the people who are employed in the white collar jobs. And some evidence show that uh, recently there has been a decline in the real wage. For example, in Egypt, there is a decline in 12, decline of about 12%. So, so, so this also shows that there is vaporization of the professionals during this period. And lastly, touching upon the inequality in the Arab world. Can I take two more minutes, please? One more minute. One more minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the Arab world, generally, it's, uh, the, the, the conventional uh, wisdom is that inequality is low. But, um, and, and it has been contested, of course. But 
We try to do some exploratory exercise by looking at the household survey expenditure and the national uh, household final consumption expenditure. Look at the gap between the total and it, it's, there is a huge gap between uh, the two and uh, since my time is, <laughs> time is running out, I'll just show this slide and then I'll conclude. Mm, uh, in the exploratory analysis, we tried to estimate the reach, the mean income of the reach as a ratio to the mean income of the different population classes. And to estimate the reach, we use the same variation of the household consumption expenditure mean, uh, and we applied it to the national household final consumption expenditure from the national account. Once we estimated the mean of the top from the national accounts, we, we took the ratio to the mean income of the different population classes from the household consumption expenditure. And, and from this slide, you can clearly see that over time, inequality is increasing. In conclusion, I think uh, this methodology is giving uh, results. Some of it is realistic, some of it is interesting also. Between 2000 and 2011, middle class share among the Arab population has remained largely stable. But of course, if we take into account the impact of the crisis, it has uh, significantly uh, reduced. Professionals remain a minority. Those who are in the white color jobs, their size increased moderately though. Uh, there has been a shift from agriculture to services sector for the middle class, but they are highly concentrated in the other services category. Even among professionals, uh, the evidence on increase in the share of professionals shows the popularization of the professionals. Economic growth has not proportionately benefited the poor uh, and the middle classes in some countries, particularly in Egypt. Lastly, increase in inequality between the top bracket of the population and the other population classes during 20, 2000 and 2011 shows that there is, the growth is not non-inclusive. And this also validates to some extent the first presentation which, which presented at the top decile there is, there is a huge inequality. And how to look at this bracket whether to 5% to 40 or 1% to 40 or look at the affluent and uh, the poorest. So this is something which would like to, I would like to conclude with to hear from you. Thank you very much.